experience. I hope you guys are, uh, you know, following the uh, the reading list so far. Uh, we have shared all the information with all of you, both in the WhatsApp group and through email. So uh, we hope that you read the chapter that needs to be read or the pages that needs to be read until today. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat or in the WhatsApp group, or you guys can also email us. Before I hand over to uh, Dr. Mohammed, this is actually an open space where we would love your reflections and questions. So feel free to at any time write your thoughts or reflections in the Zoom chat. All right, the Zoom chat is at your service. And we can even uh, open up the microphones uh, throughout the session as well uh, when it's needed and when it's possible. Uh, I also want to thank Sister Sema, who is the a task for facilitator for this halaqa for her excellent work and service. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it for you, Sister Sema. She will be also at your service sharing some information in the Zoom chat, some links. If you have not joined the WhatsApp group, feel free to do so. That's a space for reflections and also for resource sharing connected to the halaqa's purpose, inshallah. I will be at your service as the host. And I will be at service for Dr. Muhammad when it comes to reflecting upon the text from a psychological point of view. And without any further ado, uh, please, uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, take over the stage. The floor is yours, inshallah. An honor to have you with us, my beloved brother. Thank you very much, Brother Sayyid Jamaluddin. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala ishraf al anbiya wal mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Qala Rabbi Shrahli Sadri wa Yasinli Amri wa Halul Adatam min Lisani Yafkahu Qawli. قالوا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ما شاء الله كان ما لم يشاء لم يكن إلهي أنت مقصودي ورضاك مطلوب أعطني محبتك ومعرفتك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم let's begin uh, our session of this halaqa uh, by putting in our intention into our hearts so that our presence that we bring into our hearts with Allah and His Prophet وسلم, will open up the doors for us in understanding uh, some of these uh, ideas, some of the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept it uh, with some of His servants. Right? And here we are looking at the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to, to Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali. And we are reading the book of Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali by bringing in our attention and our focus into our hearts, hopefully that we are able to experience the lights huh, uh, of knowledge that is being given by Imam Ghazali. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We read the Fatiha with the intention to give and to receive benefits, to teach and to learn, to follow the Prophet Zahir and Batin, and the intention to cooperate, work together, and assist one another in Islam, in adhering to the Sharia of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah grant us complete determination and diligence in seeking beneficial knowledge, able to perform good deeds with sincerity and longevity in obedience to Him, a good ending during the time of death. Al-Fatiha bin Niyat al-Nafi wa Antifa' wa Ta'lum wa Ta'lim wa Al-Amtida bin Nabi al-Mukhtar bi Sirri wa Al-Ijihar wa Bin Niyat al-Tanasuri wa Ta'awni wa Ta'adun al-Din wa Iqamati Shari'at al-Sayyid al-Mursaleen wa Anna Allah yarakam al-Nashat wa Al-Hamma wa Jiddi wa Al-Ishtihad في طلب العلوم النافعة وعملي بها مع الأخلاص ولتل عمري في طاعة الله وحسن الخاتمة عند الموت وإلى حضرة النبي سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم وإلى المغضوب عليهم الضالين آمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الله حاضري الله ناظري الله شاهد علي الله معي الله معيني وهو بكل شيء مهد رب زدني علما ورزقني فحما برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين وبالإسناد المتصل إلى الإمام أبو حامد ابن محمد ابن محمد ابن محمد ابن أحمد التوسي الغزالي 
رحم الله عليه ونفعنا في الدرين آمين رضي الله عنكم أما بعد الحمد لله ونسجن نسيد الحمد لله صلى الله سبحانه وتعالى وبيستوفي أني سنايا yeah, in the culture of the Malay culture within Southeast Asia as long as it is still within the month of Shawwal we still wish each other Hari Selamat Hari Raya Idul Fitri so I guess alright we are still within the month of Shawwal Uh, it is uh, not late for me to wish every one of you min al-aidi dul-fa'izi lumakbul kulu am wa antum bil khair um, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all our ibadah in the month of Ramadan And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all our uh, good deeds All our visiting in 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 establishing our Siddhartha al-Rahim With our brothers and sisters, with our families Right during this month of Shawwal May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, makes our kinship stronger with one another and our brotherhood and sisterhood Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to protect our sohbah our spiritual companionship that we are having currently right in this uh, ISIP halakah right, in this ISIP halakah insyaAllah okay alright so we will straight away uh, move on to our reading of our texts as last month was the month of Ramadan so we had a shorter class for the month of Ramadan and therefore we read slightly uh, slightly less than what we have planned to read so today inshallah I'm planning to cover as much as possible the text so that we are able to catch up uh, with the pages that uh, we missed out uh, during the uh, previous month inshallah So our outline for today will be, we will start off by revisiting the previous narration, right? the previous narration of chapter of the introduction and chapter number one, where we have focused upon right, how Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali has described uh, the way, how he, the, the experience that he had, the experience that he had in the search for truth. And from the way on how he has described it, we... Uh, discuss about some of the fundamentals of youth psychology right we took that approach because that when imam abu hamid al-ghazali was uh, experiencing that epistemological crisis that he had in the very beginning of munkith min al-dalala he has mentioned that he mentioned that he was uh, at the age of near 20 years old most probably around 19 years old where that was the age where he starts off or he he decided Right, he decided to start off his intellectual autobiography at that point instead of anything earlier than that itch that he has mentioned inside his intellectual biography. So therefore, it is very significant right, why Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali at a mature age and when he was writing Munkith min al-Dalala right, at an age where he has already reached to that level of spiritual, spiritual uh, maturity has reached the intellectual robustness when he was asked the questions right, by his students or uh, about um, why, how did he overcome, uh, how did he overcome the difficulties, the intellectual and spiritual difficulty that he has overcome uh, and a few other questions, he decided to write this and start it off with that experience that he had when he was a youth. So. Based on that, that is where we came into, all right, the framework of of uh, putting this reading of Munkith Minad Dalala in trying to help us to understand our youth, to understand the fitrah of the human being, irrespective of where we are, the human fitrah, the human fitrah, the human natural exp- uh, disposition remains the same. The human constitution remains the same irrespective of which era that we are in but the different environments the detailing of this respective fitra is might be different due to the different exposure that each one of us have so therefore from a fitric point of view each single youth that we meet is unique because their soul their heart right their jasad are all exposed to different things. Right? All of them are exposed with different things. They are, di- they are exposed with different types of learning. They are exposed to different types of uh, 
exposed to different types of learning, exposed to different kinds of uh, environment. So therefore, we can see that, all right, although that it was during the time of Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali, all right, in the uh, 5th Hijri century, now we are in the 15th Hijri century, right, the details of it may differ, but the essence of the human being still remains the same. So we were trying to understand the type of spiritual education, right, the, the type of intellectual uh, empowerment that we are able to give to our youth in order for them to be able to navigate right, the various different uh, challenges that they are facing by looking at how Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali described describe that whole experience that he had right in his uncertainty or the experience that he had in his epistemological crisis uh, in chapter 1 and chapter 2 then we 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 uh discuss in the previous session where we started on into chapter number 2 which is concerning the categories of seekers we read a bit on the category of seekers is how imam abul ghazali he described them that is the ahlul kalam the ilmul kalam all right and uh, a few descriptions that he has mentioned and we will uh, pay a visit uh, we will pay a visit to those things now we move on okay so under the classical under the classes of seekers of truth okay we read we read page 9 10 and 11 uh, we read page 9 page 10 and page 11 where the classes of seekers of truth right, where imam abu hamid al-ghazali mentioned that right they are all together four okay and this category of truth uh, this category of seekers of truth right, he mentioned that uh when allah has cured him of this sickness so the sickness that he experienced all right during the time of you where it lasted two months in order for him to come into terms that there is a higher cognitive uh, faculty okay, than the intellect. Yeah, there is a higher cognitive faculty than the intellect, which he had to use analogy of the dream in order for him to come to the state of equilibrium or to the state of balance, return back to the return back to his healthy state. Uh, return back to his healthy state so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he has mentioned right it is allah's light that shone inside through his chest that the uh returning back to balance happened right so then he straight away went into all right after allah has cured his of his sickness due to his gracious favor and the vastness of his generosity imam ghazali mentioned that they are all categories of seekers right seekers of truth right seekers of truth can be reduced to four one is the theologians the other one right? the second one are the botanists and then the third one are the philosopher and then the fourth one are the sufis right? so we said we cannot run away from all these four so in this chapter it is quite a long chapter chapter number two he goes into each one of these seekers of truth and describe how come all right their methodologies was not enough to quench his thirst to quench his thirst of certainty so now how do we want to bring this all right to help us understand more all right about the fitric condition of the human being that is always searching for truth right? always searching for truth so in this category of seeker which is the theologians Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali in the passages that we have read last month, okay, on page number 10, all right, under the sciences of theology, its purpose and its fruit, all right, he has mentioned that the aims and the achievement of the theologian, a task divinely ordained to a certain group of people, meaning that the learning of kalam or having mutakallimun, this is a fardu kifaya. Right? This is a communal obligation where the community requires some people right, to be able uh, to study and comprehend this branch of knowledge. The role of the Ahlul Kalam is they preserve orthodoxy. 
orthodoxy here means, right, is those, the orthodoxy here means that the doctrine or the aqa'id that is uh, concerning the religion and their worldly life as explained by the Quran and the traditional reports. Right, so they preserve, the role of the theologian is to preserve this. And then they defended the creed, the aqidah received from Nubuwa. Uh, so their role is to defend the creed in order for the common masses are not easily influenced right, by external ideas that tries to distort the understanding of the archive. And then the fourth one is to rectify any bid'ah ad rectify any form of heretical innovation within the context of understanding God understanding Nubuwa, understanding the last day because these are the three main subject matters when it comes to theology right the three main subject matter when it comes to theology is the understanding of the godhead the understanding of allah the understanding of Nubuwa, prophethood and the understanding of yawmul qiyam right? so that's the role of uh, the ahlul kalam however at the end of that passage he said this my present intention is to explain my personal condition, not to reject those who are looking to me for healing. The medicine required for healing differ according to the difference of disease and many a the medicine is beneficial to one patient and harmful to another one. So he end this whole section on talking about the science of theology, its purpose and its fruit with this small passage talking about the role of the medicine the role of all right the, uh, the the medicine in curing the sickness what sickness was he referring to we go back to the previous uh, uh, chapters the sickness was the sickness of trying to or the sickness of wanting to arrive to truth at matter or having or wanting to have certainty of knowledge right to have certainty of knowledge but for theology imam ghazali says on page 11 this was too little avail in dealing with those who accepted absolutely nothing apart from logical necessity so theology was not sufficient where i was concerned nor did it provide a cure for the sickness of which I was complaining. So a question that probably we would like right, to reflect upon will be, why is this method of seeking truth is insufficient for Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali? Why is this method of seeking truth, the method of seeking truth that how the theologians are doing, are using right, in defending the creed, in understanding God, understanding Nubuwa, understanding yawmul kiyama but you're talking about seeking truth truth with the capital t means that wanting to know about allah wanting to get closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why is this insufficient for imam abu hamid al-ghazali would knowing why it is insufficient for imam abu hamid al-ghazali provide us insight to dimensions in youth psychology which we can consider to be universals and which that must be considered to be particulars. Why we have this universal and particulars is how I started off with the remark that each and every person is unique. So our, our philosophy in medicine and how Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali also uses uh, medicine okay, to get as the analogy to understand the right spiritual health. Right? He always uses this all right, physical health has the analogy to understand spiritual health. Good. So, and as he has uh, what is, uh, uh, discussed and informed us uh, that the soul of the human being or the whole being of the human being that comprises of what? That comprises of the roh, the qalb, the akal, and the nerves. These are the four main things. Yeah, as how it's found in Ajah Ibn Qal, uh, in the book Ajah Ibn Qal. And all these four is located within the jasad. 
within the jasad of the human being. Therefore, the health of the human being, a total health of the human being, is ensuring that all these respective components are in the state of balance. So he described to us that when he was in search for truth, somehow and another there was some form of imbalance that was happening to him. Because why? Because the akal was right the main uh, instrument that he was using at the time of youth right, in order to come into certainty. But because of the presence of the heart, the heart requires its nourishment. It was also trying to gain the attention of Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. So at that time, Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali uses the analogy of the dream in order to bring himself back to equilibrium in and acknowledging that the heart is there as a cognitive faculty which is higher than the akal. Right? And he stops down there right? in order for him to return back to the balance. Here, the matured Al-Ghazali, the spiritually matured Al-Ghazali, intellectually robust Al-Ghazali, is explaining right, the experience of the Ghazali which was a youth. This is what the book is. Okay? The Ghazali who is matured, the Ghazali that has gone through that spiritual uzla for 10 years, returned back right, to teaching. Right, and taught and wrote Ahya Anlu Muddin. By this time, he already completed writing his Ahya Anlu Muddin. Okay? Looking back at his life, how he has progressed, how did all these respective components in him was developing all right, in his life at the different stage of his life? A different stage of his life. How that development, all right, at times provided imbalance in him that he himself fell sick, right? He was not in the perfect health because here health is referring right, to the balance of all these components, right? To the balance of all these components. So when he has, when, 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 when he is talking to us about this, right? How do we use right, the universal dimensions that he has been mentioning? And then, what are things that we can consider to be particulars in order for us to understand our youth within our own cultural context in order for us to be able to help them in them searching for truth. Because the idea of searching for truth at a time of youth when you want to know things as it is, that is real. Is something that every single youth, we also you, when we were you, we had a lot of questions. Uh, we had a lot of questions. And how do we help them to get back to that state of balance and equilibrium? Uh, that state of balance and equilibrium. So these are few things that things that we have discussed. Uh, we have discussed and we have read, right? Revisiting some of these questions. Right? Let's open up for 10, 15 minutes, the most 20 minutes for us to hear some of the reflections all right, of our participant, if you have reflected, or you have ideas, all right, or clarifications, all right, or even all right, um, uh, what is insights all right, to these areas, yeah, to these areas. Zakala khairan, Dr. Muhammad. So feel free, uh, brothers and sisters, to write in the chat. If you have any reflections, you can also raise your hand if you would like to say something briefly through the microphone. I was thinking I can... You can start. Yeah, I mentioned of you can be considered universal. You know, the thing is, um, the psychology of youth is a psychology of maturity. And I think that uh, one thing that comes with age is maturity. And with maturity comes hikmah. Mm. And with maturity from a, uh, from a psychological point of view comes metacognition. And metacognition means to be able to think about your thoughts. Meta emotion means to be able to think about your emotions, to not act upon the impulses. Alluding to Imam Ghazali, rahimullah, uh, the balance of all of our uh, psychological faculty, uh, a sense, uh, comes with some form of maturity as well. Mm. I can understand that youth 
are not in that disposition yet. Even mm -hmm. biologically, they're not in that disposition yet because we know that biologically, a lot of things happen throughout the youth age and uh, a lot of hormonal shift. So even biologically, they're not dispositioned yet, but also so psychologically, they're not dispositioned as of yet. Doesn't mean that youth cannot contribute, they can. We know that many of the great Sahaba, uh, they were young. Mm. And when the Prophet Sallallahu started to uh, you know, establish halaqas like the one we're doing today, together with our beloved uh, teacher, Dr. Mubarak here, um, uh, Al Arqa, uh, anhu, he was probably 15, 16 when he opened up his house for the Prophet Sallallahu to come and do halaqa the way that we're doing here in Zoom. So age is nothing but a number in a sense, but still it's uh, it's not a number, rather uh, we need to understand different stages of life and that we have uh, some mercy and show some compassion towards youths because they're trying to engage and they're trying to understand and they're trying to find themselves uh, and perhaps we have some personal done and positive, uh, you know, thinking towards the youth. At the same time, we need to bring about the crossroad of a path from perhaps being a male into become a man or being a female into becoming a woman. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it's different of being a female and a woman and a male and a man. And in order to bring that path, we need to uh establish uh, spaces where they can do what Dr. Mubarak referred to as spiritual usla. You know, where can they do that today when they're always connected to, you know, social media or to TikTok or digitalization? That's one. And the second is to have the husnundan is to understand yourself when you were young mm -hmm. and to understand that maturity comes with age and life experience, but it also comes uh, an aspect that maybe you cannot just tell a youth to gain, which is the metacognition. Or if we want to utilize Islamic psychological terminology, tafakkur, to contemplate, which comes with age. Because uh, the first thought, the first khawatir, when I was young, I'm speaking for myself subjectively, I used to act upon it when I was young. It was like, that's the haq, the first thought that came to my mind. <laughs> now with age, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> There's a lot of other context that I need to understand and balance out. Understanding, okay, what is the ihsas of the other person? Maybe the other person who said this to me and I'm reacting with my thoughts or action didn't mean it in a bad way. So that need to cognition brings compassion, brings the ability to take one step back and reflect upon the reflection. The meta emotion is to reflect upon the emotion, and that's balance. So what Imam Ghazali exactly. is alluding to is the sense of balance. And in order, in order, uh, if you could uh, mute yourself right now, dear sister, and we will allow you to soon come into the conversation, just to summarize that balance needs maturity, but it needs guidance. We need an irshad, somebody who could guide us, or a murabbi, somebody who can guide us, or a, a sheikh, somebody who can guide us, right? And uh, even the best, like Imam Ghazali, who was so knowledgeable, he also was searching for that, you know. And that means that all of us need to search, whether we're on a high maqam or a low maqam when it comes to knowledge or spirituality, a high or low station in life. And to have that compassion and guidance and to be a parent, it's very important for the youths, but also to be mindful that some things comes with age and that we need to have that sabr as well. Just some of my reflections. Thank you very much, Brother Say. I think the interesting point that you have brought about is, which all of us know, but probably sometimes we also sometimes we 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 uh somehow ignore it. Right? Is the uh role of guides in our life? Yeah. The roles of guides in our life, and when if we were to look at the chronology of the life of Imam Muhammad Al Ghazali, when he was experiencing that. Right, so called intellectual crisis that he was at at the age of 19, he had two main teachers to guide him. That was Al Imam Al Haramain Al Juwaini, mm -hmm. okay, and he has right his spiritual teacher, which is Al Faramzi. These two, and in Nishapur, right, mm -hmm. in Nishapur. Right? Mm -hmm. So, these are two of his main teachers, uh, that uh, that that he has, right, with him at so called at his disposition. Right, to ensure and to help him right, to go through that kind of uh, what is search of truth. Although we know that right, Imam Ghazali was already a prodigy and an excellent scholar at that young age of 19 to 20 years old. Right, 19 to 20 years old. 
So how do we, right, uh, uh, be that trusted spiritual companion to our youths? Mm. How do we be that, right, in order for them to have the uh, uh, openness, easiness, and we create that kind of environment in order for us to be able to allow them to explore, to ask questions, feeling safe, feeling that they will be guided, that they will not be so-called judged, right, but allow to express themselves. And at the same time, we able to meet them where they are in order to bring them upwards, right? to bring them upwards. That's so that. Yeah, yeah. And you know what, Dr. Mubarak, uh, yeah. uh, my beloved brother, I was just thinking from uh, a colleague of mine taught me one thing, connection before correction, that yeah. we need to have connection and then correction will come. Sometimes we tend to start with correction before connection as a guy, you know, whether you're parents or a you know, teacher, whatever. But if you ask, establish the connection first, then the correction will come. And I was thinking from the aspect of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have connection with him and then we get correction from him. So this is also very important, you know, to bring that about, you know, in your relationship with all, you know, uh, you know, whether it's from the relationship with the creation or with the creator, you know, yeah. that, that both of those need to be in balance. It's very important. Jazakallah khan, Dr. Muhammad. We have a reflections um, Dr. Mubarak, we have some reflection, Dr. Mubarak, on the in the chat, and then Sister Aya has also raised her hand. Let me just start with the chat. So in the chat, uh, Dr. Sima are writing, can reaching crossroad, can reaching crossroad could be a connected to experiential crisis? I mean, any degree of experiential or identity crisis at any stage of life? Would you like to open up your microphone, Dr. Sima? Maybe you would like yeah. to ask the question yeah. directly. Yeah can explain further in your reflection uh, yes uh, i can't explain it exactly but experiential crisis what i understood is what i am experienced at the moment and i am unable to understand it and i i i am unable to place myself or I am in balance. That's I, after after a major crisis in my life, I realized that I have been through experiential crisis at many stages of my life, but I never named it as an experiential crisis. That was not an identity crisis, but I was experiencing lost, totally lost at that moment of life because of the difficulties of life, because of my struggles that I was trying to uh, balance myself in my work life, in my family life. So later on, when going through my late major life crisis, I realized that that was experiential crisis when I read about that experiential crisis. So that's what, was that the crossroad? I needed to change my direction at that moment. That's what I was asking right now. And people can go into experiential crisis or some sort of crisis at any stages of their life. There is no, um, but there's no limit to it, I, in my opinion. So like suicide, now I'm um, mentioning it, um, though it is a very difficult word to uh, say, even then I'm mentioning it like suicide could be done in youth. Even in, I have read that even at five years of age, Someone has done suicide. A child committed suicide at the age of five years. At the age of five years, it's unbelievable. And then we all we also see that suicide is done at the age of 40 years, even 60 years. So what were they experiencing? Knowing that life is very important, life is enjoyable as well as sad. Even then they commit suicide. Was that an experiential crisis? What was that? That is my question. I hope I am clear. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Sima. Uh, I seriously, I, could, I, 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 I wouldn't know and I would not be, uh, was this one to attempt to, to, to answer that question, whether those are all experiential crises or not. But if you want to bring it back to uh, uh, 
Abdul Abdul Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali, although he experienced this, he's he selected in this intellectual autobiography two points in his life that he experienced major crisis. Would he have not experienced other crises earlier and in between? Probably he would have. But these were two major points for him that changed his course of direction or his course of how he viewed things. Right, one is at his youth point, and the other one is at a more matured age where he was in his thirties after taking on uh, the uh, chair professor role in Nizamia uh, institution in Baghdad, right in Baghdad, where the first and the second crisis, the nature of it, the first one, right as we have explained. The first one, somehow and rather, right, wanted to tell the young Al Ghazali that there is a higher cognitive ability than your uncle, but he was brilliant in terms of right the way he has studied all the respective sciences, and he was studying it from uh, the intelligence or the intellect dimension, and uh, uh, this higher cognitive faculty. Is wanting to have its place and wants it wants Imam Al Ghazali to acknowledge that it is there. There is something higher. The next crisis that happens when he was a uh, professor at Nizamia College is that heart, which is that higher cognitive faculty, is telling him that it requires now the nourishment. You are you are ignoring this. You are you have acknowledged it before, all right? That it is there, but someone rather you have ignored it, and you have not nourished it. Okay, you have not nourished it. It now wants to have a place within the whole of the uh, human psychological makeup, right? The whole psychological makeup. So for Im for um, Imam Muhammad Al Ghazali, he identified these two. To be uh, the most critical point, alright, of his life that enables him to become who he was, who he is, right? By the time he was writing this, uh, without doubt, each one of us will be experiencing it uh, differently, right? Differently, uh, whether it's experiential crisis, alright, uh, life crisis, we can name it as as how we want to name it to be, okay? Uh, but we are, we are, we are. Hoping that by looking at the points that he puts in, he could give us some uh, universal ideas on how the each appropriate type of uh, education, the each appropriate type of spiritual and intellectual guidance that we can provide for our youth in their journey as they grow up and become mature. That's why there are things which will change. The particulars will change due to the respect the different environments that we are in, eh? but that development of our psychological makeup, okay, though the age where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has mentioned, right, at the age of seven, at the age of ten, and then you have the balil stage. These are, these are I would say universal checkpoints for us to consider. Right when we are looking at how we can help our children and our youth in navigating the difficulties of this contemporary lives. Allahu Rasulullah. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Mubarak. We have a couple of hands up, so uh, maybe we can take two now, and then we will move on, and then we will add more questions and reflections afterwards. And we have some questions and reflections. And please add, use the chat for questions as well to your brothers and sisters. Sister Arya, feel free. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah Dr. Mubarak, Brother Jamaluddin. I'm going to make it quick. Um, reflecting on um, Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali's uh, dilemma when he was young um, and search for the equilibrium. Now, um, if we... If I now look at the challenges or one of the main challenges with the youth currently, um, Imam Abu Hamad al Ghazali uh, felt there is an imbalance in his equilibrium. While the our youth 
um, may Allah have mercy on us and them, they think that they are perfect. For some reason, the youth these days think that they know it all. I'm not sure where they're getting it from, but the youth here that I'm dealing with in North America, they know that they, they think that they know even better than their parents. SubhanAllah, maybe it's a sign of Yom Al-Qiyama. I have no idea what's happening, but they reach to the point where um, they're not searching for more haqiqa. It's Google that they're telling them the haqiqa, and it's the science um, that um, the science-based evidence is what is the haqiqa. So when Brother Jamal Din said, connect before you correct, I think this is the one, the, the first step, um, so that uh, um, repetition of what needs to be corrected, uh, guidance, this could lead them somehow to knowing or, or discovering that there is an imbalance in the way that they're thinking. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair, sister. We had Sister Shams, but she she put down her hand. Sister Shams, would you like to take something? Um, I just wanted to, the, the, on the topic of crisis, so Ankabu, Surah Ankabu Bismillah says, do men imagine that they won't be tested just because they say we believe? Mm -hmm. So this sets the paradigm to say that actually this life is about test and challenge and crisis. If we move this to the norm, to understand that this is the norm, and if we change that to, un to use it in a space, in an understanding, in a feeling of growth. So if we say, I've grown with this episode, with this experience, I've grown. You're talking about the, you only really grow from a crisis or a challenge or a squeeze. It's um, Qabd and Basit, you know, like when we look at the names of Allah, we're talking mm. about the ethic. It is the rhythm of life that you need the squeeze to expand. So if we move ourselves into not overanalyzing too much about the crisis, but move it into the conversation of growth and knowledge, perhaps we can change some of the conversations, you know, in Bismillah. Uh, that's really what I wanted to say, that, that uh -huh. this is expected, it has to happen. Actually, that is the norm. Having a crisis, a struggle, a challenge is the norm. Mm. Bismillah. Thank you very much. Yeah, Sister Rawia, uh, a brief reflection before we go. Please go ahead. Hadir, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah khair kadir. I really, yani, Bismillah, inshallah, the, the sisters and everybody. Uh, Isma Allah Latif. If you really ponder on Isma Allah Latif in the way we teach our kids and teach ourselves first, uh, to ponder on Isma Allah Latif in the way we treat each other and treat ourselves even, and even the way we, we don't punish ourselves, gal dizet. We don't have this in Islam. This will, inshallah, reflect on our kids. And they will feel they have space to make a mistake and to be forgiven. But we are we are judging them all the time. Even if by just looking at them in, certain, uh, in, a, in a fearful way, in a frightening way. This, of course, make, uh, yeah, yeah, makes put them like an animal at bay and makes them worth, feel worthless. This is very important. And education, in, in, in our system of education, we do not... Uh, uh, focus uh, on all the cognitive skills Allah uh, yani gave us, uh, gave the human mind and, and, and ourselves, uh, only on memorization, but they become like robots. But I really, I, I would like to tell my sister, I disagree that the, the, the youth are, uh, are, uh, are, as you say, no, they are not. I learn from my children. I have uh, 38 uh, young, uh, young men and uh, 33 uh, uh, young men as well. I learn from them. They say, mom, you're living in a bubble. You don't know what's happening outside. This reminds me exactly what uh, Sayyidina Omar said, Rabbu awladakum lizamanihim, not to know uh, the way we were, we've been raised. They know, they really know, and they can navigate, inshallah. But they, th they need th that we trust them, and we give them this trust, and we give them this space. And from the very beginning, we choose our husband and choose our wife for raising a, ch a child for Allah's sake, not to just, uh, because I, 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 I'm having a good time. Thank you very much. Jazakum Allah khair. Zakalah and Sister Ravia for great reflection. Thank you, Sister Shams, as well, for great reflections. MashaAllah, many great reflections in the chat. Continue the conversation in the chat while Dr. Mubarak uh, leads us 
and we will open up for more reflections soon inshallah right. dr mama yeah. please go ahead. thank you very much for all the reflections as we have mentioned at the beginning of our halaka probably our halaka will have will raise more questions than we we can answer that's what we want all right for us to be able to raise more questions to reflect upon our practices all right and to use this munkis minat dalala as a guide not as the answer to all the crises but as a guide on how we try to navigate uh, the various different uh crises experiential crises or whatever experiences that we are having so thank you very much everybody all right for uh, the openness all right in reflecting all right in presenting your ideas all right they give a lot of uh insights uh, to many different uh things that we are doing even the cultural specific to where we are all right uh is is what we we are hearing in every one of us all right uh we have a lot of work to do <laughs> uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, in order to be able to uh guide in order to be able to uh provide all right the right environment the right uh education the right guidance all right to all those that are under our church may yeah? allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all right uh, provide us with the patience and perseverance in able to do this which are our very best and then there we tawakkal to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah all right okay now let us read our text now okay we are on page 11 with the philosophy all right uh, the the alul fayla the the philosophy Okay, let me share my screen one more time. All right. Okay. Anyone wants to volunteer to read? Your brothers and sisters, anybody who would like to read, or else I will ask Sister Ismat actually. She's active in the chat. I know that she's, mashallah, a great reader. Anybody who's volunteer, brothers and sisters? Yes, I would. I would like to read. You want to read? Okay, Sister Rami. Yeah. Okay. Yes, of course. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Do you uh, need me to? Do you need me to scroll down, or you have the text on your own? I have it. I, I have the. Uh, yes, it's okay. It's Just okay. this part. Okay. Bismillah. Uh, philosophy is produce its blameworthy aspects and uh, those uh, that are not subject to blame. Uh, what uh, what makes philosophic uh, philo a philosopher guilty of unbelief, and what does it not or does not make him guilty of thereof? What makes him guilty of heretical innovation and what does not make him guilty thereof? MashaAllah. Unbelievable. Uh, an explanation of what, just a second, an explanation of what the philo uh, philosophers have stolen from the theology of the upholders of the truth. An explanation of what they have mixed with the theology of the upholders of the truth provided in order to expose their falsehood. The nature of the failure to accept the glad tidings of revelation and the resulting aversion to that truth mixed with falsehood. The nature of the deliverance of the pure truth from the vanity and shame associated with them with their language. Uh, just uh, I stop here, please. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Anyone else wants to continue the reading? Okay, before before we continue, all right. Before we continue, just to point out certain things. Um, okay, we go back to the to the the beginning of chapter number two. Okay, for those who have missed this. So therefore, Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali. All right, is now talking about all right the the ahlul kalam. He has mentioned the ahlul kalam. Now he is going to the falasifa. Okay. Now, if we were to notice in the text, all right, you see that the theologians, meaning those who claim to be the master, 
that is alternate the Baltinia, meaning that those who claim. So this English translation of those who claim comes from two different Arabic terms. Right? It came from two different Arabic terms. The one that he used for the Ahlul Kalam and the Sufis, all right, was which is translated to be claim, all right, is he uses the term get down. Right? And the one that he uses for the esoteric, the Botania and Falasifa, which has been translated to be claim also, is yaz'am, yaz'imun. Now, these are two different terminologies. Okay? Now, what is the difference between them? The one that he uses for the Botania and the Falasifa, all right, uh, those who claim yaz'imun, is more when it is used when the opponents wants to debate with you. Yeah, he wants to debate means he's going to place their uh, uh, what is this? Uh, their way on how they look at truth and then he will point out all right with the 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 the, the inconsistency the loops holes within the points that has been mentioned so from here we see that imam abu hamid al ghazali somehow already in the very begin uh, at this beginning of chapter number two of the seeker of truth all right that he is in agreement with the theologians, the theologians' method and the Sufi method, but somehow or another he is going to all right, refute all right, or debate with about the methodology that is being used by the Botania, the Ismailis, and, and also by the philosopher. Right? By the philosopher. So that's why you will see within this that the one on the theologians, they are quite short. Okay, the one with the philosophy and the Baltinia, they are quite long. But he is elaborating on them at the same time, he is pointing out uh, the different uh, things that he disagree with their methodology. Right? With their methodology. Okay, that's something that I'd like to point out to everyone okay, in these translations here. Alright, so, okay, so these are the sections in the philosophy okay, that these uh, eight bullet points that he will deal with. When he is talking about uh, the falsa, the ahlul falsafa, right? The ahlul falsafa in term in in the, uh, delineating or explaining their methodology, right? Their methodology. Okay, All right. Uh, anyone would like to continue? Um. If there, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If there's no none, then I would, uh, inshallah, read it. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. All right. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanaka la ilman la illa ma'allamtuna innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Rabbi zhidni ilma. Please forgive my shortcomings if I read something wrong. And uh, of course, my Indian English would be differentiating from here and there in an accent. Okay. No so, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. After completing my study of theology, I embarked on the science of philosophy. As I came to know for certain, a person will not become familiar with the unsoundness of any kind of science if he does not acquaint himself to the utmost extent with the science of philosophy. He must start by matching the most learned of its scholars at its basic level, then rise above him to a higher degree. He must be better informed of its delusion and its dangers than the master of the science, for only then will he be possible, will it be possible for what he claims about its unsoundness to be proven true. As far as I could see, not, not one of the scholars of Islam had devoted his attention and his aspiration to that purpose. The books of theologians contained no serious treatment of philosophy in their efforts to refute the philosophers, they cited nothing but extravagantly complex statements, obviously inconsistent and unsound, by which no common simpleton could conceivably be misled. Let alone someone professing detailed knowledge of the sciences, I realized that it was, I realized that it was shooting in blind ignorance to refute a school of thought before understanding it and studying its essence. I buckled down to the task of acquiring that knowledge directly by, by piercing the books of the philosophers without, without seeking the assistance of the teacher. I tackled that in the moments I had to spare from compiling and teaching about the Islamic legal sciences, for I was heavily occupied in the teachings 
in the teaching and instruction of 300 students in Baghdad. Through study confined to these spare moments, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enabled me to understand the full extent, enabled me to extend, uh, to understand the full extent of their sciences in less than two years. I then persisted diligently in reflecting upon it for nearly a year after understanding it. I kept going back to it, reviewing it and examining, and examining its errors and its delusions until I was thoroughly acquainted beyond all doubts with all, with all what it contained in the way of deception and, disor and distortion, veracity and fancity, fantasy. Now it is time for you to hear all about it and to receive a full account of a produce of their sciences. I have considered them in categories and treated their sciences in sections. Most of their categories brand them with a mark of unbelief and apostasy, ap apostasy although there is a vast disparity between the, between the ancient among them, ancients among them and the moderns, between the most recent and the, mo and the earliest, in distance from the truth and, near, and, near, and nearness thereto. Thank you very much. Just pause for a while. We just point out certain things. Uh, thank oh. you very much, sister. Uh, okay, now we go back to the text. Okay, down here. So Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali. Okay, remember he moves on. Okay, from telling about he's coming back into equilibrium, and then all right, he knows that the seekers of truth belongs to four categories. He starts off first with the theologians. Right, he start off first with the theologians. Means at that age of nineteen years old, all right, he studied all right the theology, and we know that he has he wrote a couple of books, all right, couple of very important books on uh, uh, on on theology, right, on on theology. Then he moves on, all right, to the study of philosophy. Now the interesting thing about this is that. Uh, the study of philosophy, okay, when he says down here, is that I tackled that in the moments I had to spare from compiling and teaching about the Islamic legal sciences, right? So this is Fiqh, when he was teaching jurisprudence, for I was heavily occupied in the teaching and instruction of 300 students in Baghdad. So that whole uh, search, all right, the whole search of uh, understanding the methodology of the Fahid Lasuf, all right, happens seriously or taken up seriously by Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali when he was in Baghdad, when he was already being appointed, right, when he was already being appointed as the chair professor in Baghdad, in Baghdad. So that is approximately around the age of thirty-two or thirty-three years. Old. Right, 32 and 33 years old. Now, between the time, right, of that 19, 20 until the age of 32, okay, of course, he was studying. And there are some Al-Ghazalian scholars who mentioned that it is not that this was the first time that Imam Muhammad Al-Ghazali was studying the peripatetic philosophers or, 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 or was this, um, studying the various schools of philosophy, right, the various schools of philosophy, that was in existence during that period of time. He had already started it together with Imam Al Haramain when he was in Nishapur. Yeah, when he was in Nishapur. But those study was more right from the. That's why he mentioned that what he has observed that the theologians, when they were dealing with the philosophers, they were not thorough enough when dealing with the philosophers. So meaning he was already exposed. Uh, to the ideas of philosophy, all right, in the earlier times of his study, but he went into serious in, in looking at philosophy in order for him to refute the philosophers. He needs to understand them, understand their methodology, to take on the best among them, be, and be master above them, okay, for him to be able all right, to refute them and to show the inconsistency all right, that existed within the study of philosophy in understanding truth. Right? Back to right, the whole 
so called sickness that that he was experiencing because he is explaining this based on or in relation to that sickness the sickness that he experienced that he was in search of truth right yeah, in search of truth having that certain one thing to experience and quench his thirst for certainty and this is al ghazali as he age as he becomes small matured as he takes on more responsibility yeah, as he takes on more responsibility okay so that's the, the the context of how he has put it right in his other works in his later works like say for example right in his mishkatul anwar uh, in his mishkatul anwar okay uh, how he explained about the philosophers there is a slight change right in the way on how he categorized the philosophers all right now that change does not show inconsistency in how he was looking at them but it shows the kind of maturity all right that happens at the time when he was writing remember here he is writing okay at that age all right where he is almost turning 50 years old all right after gone through all the various experiences right, the various experiences okay reflecting back upon what he did all right as he grew all right in the various stage of his life uh, in his various stage of his life so that's uh, the context that uh, we need to uh, to understand when we are reading uh, this part of munkith uh, this part of munkith because there are many parts of there are many areas of philosophy that uh, by the peripatetic philosophy that imam abu al amin al ghazali adapts it takes it uh, it's only a few dimension a few parts of philosophy the peripatetic philosophy Uh, that he is a uh, uh, was is a critic of uh, a critic of uh, as some of us already would have known that okay so uh, dr mubarak yeah. just a question if, yeah. if you may if you go up to that paragraph that you were reflecting about on chapter 12 uh, on page 12 which okay just to reflect not uh, just there yeah yeah exactly he says that he was uh, no a little bit lower please lower or okay yeah yeah so he says, uh, I buckled down hmm. to the task of acquiring that knowledge directly by pursuing the books of the philosopher without seeking the assistance of a teacher. This hmm. is something I wanted to ask you, Dr. Mubarak. Hmm. Hmm. Because in our tradition, we study works with our teachers, right? But hmm. he did that without the teacher. Hmm. Uh, would you say that this is just people on the level of Imam Ghazali in that age or, that are able to do that without assistance? This is something that I'm thinking about connected to the discussion of youths. A lot yep. of youths, yep. not only youths, adults as well, honestly, mm. you shouldn't just say mm. to the youth. They go into the quest of knowledge inquiry without teachers nowadays, mm. you know, just, to, you know, let's say YouTube for an example or, mm. you know, whatever sources. So I'm just reflecting upon that connected yeah. to our uh, yeah. discussion. That's why, that's, why, uh, that's why I pointed out that uh, when he said this, where was he, who was he at that time? Yeah, he exactly. was already a chair professor at the highest institution of learning of his time. He is the number one man, so-called the number one scholar during that period of time. Uh, so he is there already. Uh, he is already there, okay, uh, at the age of 32, all right, approximately around that age, where he goes back, all right, into what he has learned about philosophy. So it's not that he is starting with philosophy from scratch of zero. No, he has learned philosophy before. And how we know that he has learned philosophy? Because he was already describing, all right, the, the books of theologians contain no serious treatment of philosophy. In their effort to refute the philosopher, they cited nothing but extravagantly complex statements. So all this tells us that while he was studying, all right, theology, with Imam al haramain al juwaini he was already exposed all right, to the statements of the philosophers and how the theologians of his time, even his teacher, right, has tried, refuted the philosophy, the philosophers, but to, he didn't find the refutation right, that was already there all right, by the earlier theologians sufficient, all right, sufficient enough all right, to indicate that there is some form of um, inconsistency within all right, the method of seeking truth that has been described by the philosophers. So here, without a teacher, all right, 
without uh, the assistance of a teacher is due to him all right, being the chair professor and he was already at the top level. Right, the top level. Not, uh, I would say, applicable to people like us. Yeah. <laughs> we require teachers. <laughs> we require teachers. Sure. That's for sure, yeah. <laughs> I think it's great to clarify that as well for all of us yeah. to understand, you know, yeah. like, I think it's great. Yes. Definitely for youth, they require guides. That, they, they cannot do that. <laughs> they cannot be, be, be doing that. Okay. Uh, where was I just now before you asked the question? <laughs> I forgot. We're supposed to go down to next. Oh, uh, down to next. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To the next page. Okay. So now he's going to talk about the different categories of the philosophers. And the ascription of unbelief to them all. Okay, all right. Anyone wants to continue reading this? Anybody who's interested, your brothers and sisters, don't feel shy. This is a space for us to learn. And English, it could be expressed in different dialects. <laughs> That's beautiful. So. I think I can with Brother Jamal, if you approve. Mashallah, Professor Suleiman, what a blessing. <laughs> yes. reading from you, mashallah. Our teacher is looking for us, mashallah. Brother <laughs> Mubarak, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Prof. Yes. Yes. It's an honor to have you with us. Please help us also in understanding this. Yes, Alhamdulillah, I am your student, brother. Bismillah. The categories of the philosophers and the ascription of unbelief to them all. You should know that the philosophers, despite the multiplicity of their groups and the variety of their schools, are divisible into three sections. The atheist, the Hriyun, the physicist, Tabayun, and the deist, Ilahiyun. The first category, the atheists, the Hriyun. They are a part of the Asians who deny the existence of the all-controlling maker, the all-knowing and the all-powerful, and who maintain that the universe has always existed as it is by itself, not because of a maker. They maintain that the animal has always come from the sperm and the sperm from the animal. That is how it, ha how it has always been and that is how it will always be. These are also known as the Zanatika, free thinkers, infidels. The second category, the physicists, Tabi'iyun, they are a group of who devoted most of their research to the realm of nature and to marvels of the animals and the plants. They paid great attention to the anatomy of animals in which they saw so many wonders of the craftsmanship of Allah, exalted is he, and such marvels of his wisdom that they were compelled to acknowledge one who is all powerful and wise aware of the aims and the purposes of things. No researcher investigates the wonders and benefits of anatomy without acquiring this inevitable knowledge of the perfection of the constructor's arrangement of the structure of the animal and especially the structure of the human being. Nevertheless, because of the great scope of their study of nature, they attached enormous importance to the balance of the physical constitution as the effective means of sustaining the powers of the animal. So they assume that the mental power of the human being is also dependent on his physical constitution. They suppose that it is nullified by the nullification of his physical constitution and so becomes non-existent. Then when it ceases to exist, the restoration of the non-existent is inconceivable or so they maintained. Mm. They held the view, therefore, that the soul dies and does not return. So they believed in the hereafter. They denied the reality of the garden of paradise and the fire of hell, the, the resurrection and the reckoning. According to them, there will be no reward for worshipful obedience and no penalty for sinful disobedience. So the bridle of restraint fell from them and they became engrossed like cattle in the satisfaction of carnal appetites. They are also infidels, Zanatika, because the root of faith is belief in Allah and the last day, and they have disbelieved in the last day. 
and if they have believed in Allah and his, and his attributes. The third category, the deists, ilahiyun. They are the latest of the philosophers like Socrates, who was the teacher of Plato, while Plato was the teacher of Aristotle. It was Aristotle who organized logic for them, refined the sciences for them, formulated for them what had been, not been clearly formulated previously, and ripened for them what had been unripe in their sciences. All three of them rejected the first two categories, the atheists and physicists, and by exposing their faults, they provided others with benefits. And Allah averted the assault from the believers. How was it? Yes. Then Aristotle rejected Plato and Socrates and the deists who had preceded him with a rejection in which he didn't stop short until he had washed his hands of them all. Except that he also retained remnants of the vices of their unbelief and heresy, which he didn't succeed in shedding. It is necessary to accuse them of unbelief and to declare the unbelief of their followers among the Islamic philosophers like Ibn Sina, Avicenna, Al-Farabi and others. None of the Islamic philosophers went so far as these two men in transmitting the sciences of, science of Aristotle, yet what others transmitted is not free from delirium and insanity in which the heart of the citizen is so disturbed that he cannot understand. How can he reject or accept what he doesn't understand? Of Aristotle's philosophy, as transmitted by these two men, all that we really know can be divided into three parts. One, a part that must be regarded as unbelief. Number two, a part that must be regarded as heretical. Number three, a part that must not be rejected absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, Prof. We pause for a while. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so here uh, Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali give us in brief, all right, of the various schools of philosophy, all right, that existed, all right, from the ancient to and to to his time, all right. So the first group of philosophers are those that reject, basically the atheists, those that rejected, all right, the existence of a maker. Full stop. And this one, all right, very clearly, ah, uh, very clearly that they are uh, disbelievers. The second one will be the Tabi'iyuns, right? Those who look at the wonders, all right, of the world, all right, but uh, at the same time, all right, they acknowledge the existence of Creator, but did not acknowledge the existence of the hereafter. So knowing that when it comes to the idea of theology, when you're talking about the seeking of truth, the seekers of truth, all right, the subject matter deals with Allah, Nubuah and the hereafter. These three are the main categories or the main subject matters right, that we that needs to that that constitute belief. Right, that constitute belief. So this group, right, uh, so Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali also brand them right, to be unbelief because the root of faith is belief in Allah in the last day, and they had this belief in the last day even if they have belief in Allah and his attributes. So this group of people believe in the existence of the maker, believe in the existence of the transcendent being, but did not believe in right, the last day, did not believe in the judgment day. Right? So this is the second one. Where, where his focus is going to be is will be the categories of the ilahiyuns, the categories of philosophers who are within, all right, who believe in the existence of God, all right, and also believe in the existence of the hereafter. Okay? And among this, all right, the uh, uh, among the philosophers, right, among the philosophers, okay, who are in this category, having their roots from the Greek, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, all right, he specifically mentioned that Ibn Sina and Al Farabi are the two most uh, active scholars within the Islamic intellectual tradition of the past, means before him, right, that has transmitted 
that have thought that has reformulated and many things right that this too has done right in promoting or propagating the philosophy that is been right uh, propagated by aristotle yeah right? by aristotle now that whole corpus right that whole corpus of philosophy okay that is coming down from the line of aristotle so which we call it the peripatetic when we call it the peripatetic philosophers right it is referring to this school of aristotle yeah but of course from aristotle time to ibn al farabi or even al kindi right uh, he didn't mention al kindi right but al kindi if you want to talk about all right uh, the starting point all right of this peripatetic philosophy we can we can talk about al kindi and then al amiri all right al farabi uh, ibn sina right and a few others that comes from ibn sina to imam abu hamid al ghazali there are also a few other peripatetic philosophers all right uh, in in between these two but he selected ibn sina and al farabi meaning that these are the two main ones all right who have written a lot and what they have written all right from imam al ghazali's point of view can be categorized into three things through three categories one that uh, cannot be accepted all right these premises of them cannot be accepted the other one is they are heretical it does not constitute to unbelief but they are innovations when it talks about innovations here heretical what do what does imam al ghazali means when you talk when you say that it is innovation means it is innovation in relation to uh, in relation to it is not the way on how the salaf us saleh understood it that's how imam al ghazali defines when he uh, said that something is innovative is is innovation and that definition he gives in faisal tafriqat bain al islam wa zandaqa right another book faisal tafriqat bain al islam wa zandaqa the distinguishing criteria between islam and godlessness so down there all right he mentioned when we said unbelief what do we mean when we say that it is misguided what it means when we say that it is a uh, heretical innovation what it means so here all right heretical innovation all right in that book we mean heretical innovation means in relation to that uh, when it comes to the part of aqida or the explanation of aqaid it is not something that is been propagated that is been passed down or that has been discussed that has been believed in or the position of stand of the salafus saleh yeah of salafus saleh so that's what it means by all right heretical down here and then the third part a part that must not be rejected absolutely so he is very clear all right it's not that one you see all right which one you can take which one you have to be careful which one you can take absolutely 100% you do not have to worry all right whether it is right or whether it is wrong so that's how imam al ghazali has categorized all right the philosophers okay when he was studying them at that okay being a scholar right, of that level at the age of 32 a mature scholar intellectually all right a mature scholar intellectually uh, being a scholar that everyone wants to study with in zambia all right two years of studying it okay and then one year in being able all right to write and understand it that's where the production of maqasid al falasifa and also tahafud al falasifa happens right two two words right maqasid al falasifa right the um, the purposes of the philosophers where he wrote and systematized what the philosophers are saying and then he wrote tahafud al falasifa the incoherence of the philosopher so in tahafud al falasifa that's where he points up to us all right using the methodology of how the philosophers all right has come up with their conclusion which is through syllogism burhan or logic mantiq right that's the methodology that is been used all right with by philosophy and also by by kalam also so called copy this that's why he mentioned at the very beginning how does the theologians all right when they look at the philosophers they copy them so they copy that methodology as part of it which is syllogism burhan all right burhan so in tahafud al falasifa he puts in all right he 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 writes down the the premises 
right, the premises in the mantik, right, the premises in the mantik, and question the truthfulness of the mantik. So when you when the, the truthfulness of the premises, when the premises has been questioned, the conclusion that comes out from all right, the two premises, the general and the specific premise, all right, cannot be absolutely true. Now, that's where he showed the incoherence of the philosophers. Now, the incoherence of the philosophers. All right, I think what we will do now is uh, I will pause here. All right, I will pause here. The next part, the subdivisions of the subject matters of the philosophy, all right, is quite long. It's from page 15 to page 24. Right? I think we will read that. Uh, in the in in our next session, uh, in our next session, uh, we can devote more time, all right, to reading this so that we can cover, uh, the thing and then we will bring it back, uh, towards uh, our understanding of psychology uh, and our reflection on it, all right. So right now, the, probably anyone who wants to 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 reflect, all right, to have to give some of his opinions after reading this, for a fazal mashkur. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Mubarak. I'm mindful also that we have five minutes left. Mm. Uh, yeah, because so you're in an event after this, right? Yeah. It's been a very interesting session today, actually. An interesting reading. There's a lot of great reflections in the chat. So I will read up some of the reflections, uh, Dr. Mubarak, with your yeah, permission. Yeah. Just for us to reflect upon. And please forgive uh, me, dear brothers and sisters, because I won't be able to go through all the excellent reflections, all right? So... No, <clears> these Sorry. reflections uh because because we are recording it we can also save this in terms of the chat uh, you mean sorry what did you say dr mobile one, one more time one that is in the chat if we cannot read all of them we can still save this reflection and not uh, it will be upload uh, on the youtube channel we won't be able to see the reflections well what we can do actually we can yeah, copy we can. Paste the reflections and share it in the whatsapp group we can do that inshallah yeah, we can do that that's something we can do, yeah. inshallah okay. yes yeah. so sister Sama, feel free to do so afterwards inshallah all right, so I'm just going through. There's a lot about the youth and reflections about the youths. So, for instance, there is a reflection here, and I'm scrolling as we speak because I remember that I read it and I found it very interesting. So, for instance, uh, yeah, so Sister Swad is writing, our youth live in a society which is very different to ours while we were growing up. So we need to change our own approaches to dealing with our current situation. Very, very interesting. Abdul is writing, in case this is useful, if youth have too much faith in technology, all AIs are driven by data and limited applicability, media likes and accentuate, ex, uh, exaggerate AI. Uh, so there's a discussion about AI. We will not go into that today because this is beyond the scope of the halaqa. Um, then it's about, uh, for instance, uh, Sister Smat is writing that she wants to reflect to Sister Aya's point. To me, it is very critical, and I feel it's not only youth that thinks that they know the best. What they are doing is nafsani. This could be said and done by someone who is in old age as well. The point is we are not balancing. We are not well aware of what's nafsani, qalbani, aqlani, and rohani. As Ustad mentioned, it is all about balancing, equilibrium. Imam Ghazali, rahimullah, I believe, has emphasized on you to show how important this age is to build a true foundation and balance in it. Yes, mashallah, very good reflection. Then Sister Safia, uh, Safia is asking, what is the Arabic word for theologians and Sufi? Would you like to tell? The, would you like to refer to that uh, just to briefly answer that question, Dr. Mubarak? What is the Arabic word for? Arabic word for theologians and Sufi. Theologians will be mutakallimuns, uh, and Sufi will be Sufis. Yeah. Sufis. Yes. So, <clears throat> and then Sister Shams is saying, we are the youth too, and we were youth once, and we too, th and we too think we know better, and so the learning continues gently. It's not them and us. It is us, and we are all reflections of each other. True. I'm learning much about tech in this generational time and space from my son, and more importantly, in this interaction, I learn about me. I grow as my youthful son grows, subhanAllah. And then, uh, let's see here. Uh, Zainif is writing, true that. We can't just say that youths are like that. In fact, in phrases that a youth goes through, in phases that youth goes through, the first seven years, raise them with love. The next seven years, raise them with routine and structure. The next seven years, raise them as though you're their friends, give them good advice. And this is the time when they are skeptical about things. 
when they turn 21, treat them as an adult. Last but not least, wisdom life begins only at 40, prophethood, sainthood, etc. occurs only at 40, so we can't blame youths if they are not wise. Everyone continues to seek knowledge through their different phases in life. SubhanAllah, great reflections. So yeah, these are some of some of the reflections. Abdulaziz is writing, perhaps Imam Ghazali emphasized that he did not require the assistance of a teacher, not because he did not need one, but he was able to comprehend it. Had it been something was obscure, he would have sought clarification from a knowledgeable person. Yes. And then he says, at his level of expertise and position, he would not need to review a subject detail to detail before of a teacher, except when it's beyond his comprehension. This is just his reflection, Allahu alam. And then perhaps, yes, Sister Safia is writing a question that I actually think is a good question to see if we can answer it together. In today's time, there are those who promote teaching on psychology based on temperaments, understanding the human being through their temperament, for example, sanguine melancholy. Is this the same category that's described as the belief of the naturalists? What do you say, Dr. Mubarak? I think understanding the human being through the temperament, angry, melancholy, and the rest, I think it, it, is, uh, it is an aspect of understanding the human being. And it is okay for us to use it to help us to understand the essence of the human being. It is not that these uh, four categories of the temperaments describe the human being in its totality, right? So our approach will be that, right? Yes, this is an aspect of us to help us understand the human being. It is not something which is in totality. So therefore, we can still use it. Eh? We are, we are uh, no, not, not an issue at all for us to use it. And just to add to what Dr. Mubarak said, in the Yunani Tib tradition, which was Islamized version of the Greek you know, medicine, they refer to the four temperaments, but they Islamized it, of course. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Mubarak, for the clarification. The last reflection, and then Professor Darin, you will end the whole session for us. Oh, yeah. What a blessing to have our hujjah here to end things with us. And of course, our great teacher, Dr. Mubarak. Uh, uh, Zainif is writing, true that many scholars opine that not opinions and opine the knowledge has four levels. At the lowest level, knowledge is uh, just information. At the next level is, the, is knowledge ilm itself. There is a profound definition of knowledge as uh, arrival of meaning of an object to the soul and the arrival of the soul to the meaning of an object. The next level is understanding fahm. And the highest level knowledge is known as wisdom hikmah. Barakallahu feekum, barakallahu feekum, barakallahu feekum. Everyone, jazakallah khairan for your reflections. We will share the reflection. There's a lot of great insights in the chat, by the way. Uh, Dr. Mubarak, uh, we will uh, allow you to uh, end, of course. But before that, our, uh, just our hajjah. Yes, yes brother, to yes, enter yes, the yes, stage. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to just take your attention to the subject that we read. Uh, philosophy today, uh, Islam is uh, under attack from uh, Western materialistic, hedonistic philosophies. Even in psychology, we see that, you know, there is no God in psychology. It is all about evolution and, you know. So actually we should bring uh, new defenses of Islam against these uh, Western materialistic, hedonistic philosophies, you know. And all youth, and uh, actually not youth, all most Muslims are in the trap of these uh, foreign philosophies, anti-Islamic uh, philosophies. Al Ghazali criticized and even uh, you know blamed some of these uh, philosophies as disbelief, unbelief, or zindqiya. Actually, we should uh, follow Al Ghazali's path today and label some of the dangerous philosophies that uh, you know threaten Islam, Muslims, and all youth. Uh, unfortunately, we are not doing enough. As uh, Al Ghazali is probably the last person who made a tariq uh, criticism of philosophy. And then a little bit partial criticism of philosophy, but not enough. Also, this Bataniya uh, uh, is, you know, these Sufis who have no Sharia kind of thing. Unfortunately, it's very popular. Some people want a Sufism without a Sharia. Uh, and I call this Bataniya. If you see any Sufi, so-called Sufi, claiming to be a Sufi, a mystical person, but without following Sharia, in my opinion, he's a Batani. Ismaili kind of philosophy, not a real Sufi. Thank you.
Hujam, Dr. Professor Dari, mashallah. We're blessed to have uh, Hoj our Hujam with us here, inshallah. Learning from you has always been a joy for all of us as your students. And alhamdulillah, shukrullah. We pray that the situation in Turkey will turn out well. Today is a very important day. For those well, there are elections today. Please yeah, pray for, you know, we'll our, for, uh, we'll president, for president. Pres present president to get elected again mm -hmm. uh, inshallah uh, mm -hmm. he will elect it otherwise uh, you know uh, turkey is that will not be doing well in future thank you inshallah inshallah we'll make dua for all of you inshallah inshallah jazakallah khairan uh, professor darin an honor to have you with us and learn from your vast amount of knowledge uh, dr mubarak uh, any last uh, remarks from you before we summarize and then i will just say a couple of words as well thank you very much bro for your uh, inputs and right, in providing us with uh, what is doors for us to explore further, and thank you everybody, and right, for reading, you know, and uh, contributing in our halakha down here. As we have mentioned, that um, our halakha wants to uh, bring up questions, and questions are important that will open further uh, more doors for research in order for us to be able uh, to help. All right, our youths to have everybody in whatever age that they are all right, in looking at a psychology from a more holistic perspective, a more integrated health, all right, a more integrated way on how we see all right, the human being, not just from the Western perspective of the human being, but from an Islamic perspective where we give each and every component of the human being its due rights and nourishment so that we are able all right, to come back into our balance, inshallah. So, inshallah, in the next uh, session, all right, we will continue talking about the subdivision of the sciences based on our uh, schedule. Our next session is not in June, but it's in July. Right? So, with that, uh, we will pass it over to Brother Said Jamaluddin. Our beloved uh, teacher and Dr. Mubarak, thank you for giving out of your precious time. We really appreciate doing this halaqa with you. I've had the honor to be a colleague of you for over a year and I learned so much from our interaction to share uh, our brother, Dr. Mubarak, to the rest of the Ummah. It's truly a joy because he is truly a source of so much knowledge and wisdom. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve you and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring you as a means of, of more uh, knowledge inquiry for all of us and more for the tradition of our predecessors and all the ulama and righteous led scholars. Ameen. Thank you, Dr. Mubarak, for always being with us. An honor to have you with us. Thank you, Professor Dereen. Thank you, all beloved brothers and sisters, for your reflections, for your questions, for your insights, and for your input. Feel free to continue the discussions in the WhatsApp group. I have noticed that the WhatsApp group dies after a couple of days, so please keep it alive. Discussions needs to be there all the time. Don't feel shy. We're all learning. It's okay to think, and it's okay to reflect. We will learn from each other. We will do sometimes mis mistakes. That's perfectly fine. We learn from mistakes. And this is also the aspect of trials and tribulation. We learn from trials and tribulation. Nobody is perfect. Perfection is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're all imperfected. We're all imperfect as creation. <laughs> the creator is perfect. So bring that about. Don't be shy. Because I saw a lot of interaction in the chat today, and we want that. We will also create another WhatsApp group. Because a lot of people have written to me personally saying that sometimes they cannot... Uh, handle too much information on WhatsApp. So we will create one closed WhatsApp group only for information about the halaqa, all right? And then we will have one only open for reflections and discussions about the halaqa, nothing else, just about the halaqa and everything we read uh, uh, throughout the halaqa. All other discussions, we have other groups for that, all right? In June, we will not meet and uh, we will meet in July again. Doesn't mean that we should not continue the reading and the reflections. So we really encourage you to continue the reading and reflections. And if there is any update about the schedule, we will announce that through email and also through the WhatsApp groups. And shall also keep yourself updated. Join the WhatsApp group. Sister Sema just shared them. Join the Imam Ghazali. Some of you are new. I read in the chat. Some of you just came about this uh, halaqa and knowledge about this halaqa through other groups. Join the WhatsApp groups, both the one for uh, Halaqa uh, of Imam Ghazali and the other for the Islamic Psychology Research Sharing Group, where you can get more access to resources related to Islamic psychology and related sciences as well. Please forgive me as your brother and host for any shortcomings from my side and all the good from anything that we as ISAP do is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the mistakes are mine. Your brother Sayyid Jamaluddin, mistakes are mine. I want to thank Sister Sema for excellent input and work as the facilitator. There's always importance of being uh, you know, 
under the surface working also. Without those who are working on the field, we will not be able to do halakhas. Uh, uh, I always say that uh, those who write the biography of our scholars are actually those who preserve the tradition as well. So maybe they're not as famous as our scholars, but they're equally important because they're preserving the tradition. So all types of positions in the movement is important. And for the student to speak about his teacher, uh, is also a benefit because that's how we have learned from all the knowledge of Imam Ghazali, many of our excellent scholars. So just have in mind, brothers and sisters, all types of positions are very beneficial for further normalizing Islamic psychology and Islamic thought. And just to finalize with the thoughts of Professor Darin, we need to stand up. In this modern day, we have modern day we have a lot of new ideologies that are infiltrating Islamic thought um, uh, consciously and subconsciously, and we need to do it standing on that based on knowledge. We need to be knowledgeable in order to stand up. And Imam Ghazali was knowledgeable. That's why he could refute. But if you're not if you're not knowledgeable and you're refuting, that it could be very nafsani. So let's refute these uh, ideologies that are distorting our path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But let's be knowledgeable when we do it as well. And because this is very important to be rooted in your tradition when you refute. But it's important, as Professor Darin says, to take a stand and put solid boundaries and root ourselves in our own tradition, strengthen ourselves, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, everyone. I wish you all a great continuation of the day. And 20 minutes from now, we're going to have a lecture in ISIP with the Professor Francesca Boca, uh, which is actually a colleague of both Dr. Mubarak and myself. We studied together, and she will speak about Islamic psychology uh, and connection to arts. So all of you are more welcome to join that. We will share more information. Jazakallah khairan, everyone. I wish you all a great day and honor to be with all of you, brothers and sisters. You're all doing an amazing job. We're honored to have you all as an integral part of our movement. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ma sha Allah. Jazakallah khairan, Dr.